All right. Since we have a quorum, we'll call to order the Environmental Action Committee meeting for May 16, 2016. Go around and do some introductions first. Uh, Mike Emery, Ward 4, and current chair. Kelly McGulick, Ward 3, science representative. Andrew Miles, Ward 4, and current vice chair. Steve Niergarten, I'm the city sustainability director and the staff liaison on the Environmental Action Committee. Dane Eifling, I'm the bicycle progress coordinator at the city of Bayville. Bernard Wise, I'm the industrial uh, EAC member. Kyle Smith, Ward 4. Richard Russell, Ward 1. All right. Um, anybody have anything they want to add to this agenda before we get going? I do want to, um, I didn't, didn't make it on there, but I was just going to give a very brief update at the end on the uh, recycling master plan. All right, cool. Okay, cool. All right, then we will move on to new business. The day on bike share. Peer exchange in Evanston, Illinois, that was really productive. Uh, we got to visit some other cities across the country that are in a similar boat. Uh, bike share has been traditionally kind of a, a bigger city thing, but smaller cities are finding some trust with it. And, uh, but there are some, some issues uh, that just need to get dealt uh, with. So, uh, with that, uh, I'll just jump in and start talking about some of the work that we've uh, done and how it relates to the bigger picture. So, uh, for anybody that's not really familiar with bike share already, uh, some of you may have seen in other cities. Uh, bike share systems may have even written them, um, or you may uh, know a lot about it, but just a, a quick definition is an, it's an innovative transportation program, ideal for short distances, point to point recreation trips, uh, providing the user the ability to use a bicycle without the need to purchase, store, and maintain a bicycle. Uh, so it really lowers the threshold for uh, people that want to uh, use a bicycle. Uh, how it works. Uh, there are a lot of different technologies out there, a lot of different uh, platforms, companies, but these <coughs> four steps as far as how it works remain the same uh, from the lowest tech, uh, most basic system to you know, the cutting edge uh, right now. But basically you register for a membership. That membership can be uh, of almost any duration uh, from anything from a day up to a year, um, and that allows you to access the system. Uh, and then you uh, go and you pick your bike, take a ride, and then you return the bike. Uh, and the return can be done now um, at uh, off station with the smart bike technology. Uh, the docking station is kind of a mainstay of, of traditional bike share, but uh, the technology now allows you to return the bike uh, anywhere in your ride anywhere, uh, and because the bike is, is locatable by GPS. So that's, that's something that we're really interested in for Fayetteville. Uh, bike share has been growing rapidly, uh, not just in the U.S., but across the world. Uh, there are uh, thousands of stations for, uh, systems worldwide. Um, you see the rapid growth, really, the technology coming in line, um, you know, a lot of, along with all of the you know, transportation pressures that there are in cities, parking, and this, uh, traffic, and all those sorts of things, really fueled uh, rapid growth. And when we're looking 
looking at Fayetteville uh, specifically, uh, we see that about half of all Americans have access to a working bicycle, whereas this year in Fayetteville, you've got 1.6 automobiles per household. We have a lot of uh, a lot of people have access to a car that don't necessarily have access to a bicycle. So again, lowering that threshold and looking at proximity. Um, Fayetteville is not a very densely populated city overall, um, and so we're looking at you know the locations where we can get the most uh, appropriate use of, of bike share and uh, centralizing a system. And we're looking at uh, destinations being about a half a mile apart for walking, but when you talk about a, a bicycle, uh, you can go two miles in about 10 minutes. So that really spreads things out where you can reach a lot of destinations very quickly uh, with a bicycle that you might not be able to be walking. Uh, I think people are often surprised at how quickly they can get places on a bicycle, and especially with the trail network, um, which is uh, rapidly <coughs> growing as well. And we have, uh, we have here a couple of maps that show uh, the percentage of folks in Fayetteville that have access to a trail within half a mile or uh, a 10 minute walk from their home. Um, we're currently right around 55 percent. More than half the people have um, free, uh, you know, immediate trail access. But as we start to fill in these uh, these missing gaps uh, in the next five years, we're going to have a lot more folks, um, 85 percent. And then thinking long term, we want to provide trail access to just about every household in Fayetteville and adding in our on-street bicycling network with bike lanes and infrastructure that will allow you to get each almost anywhere in the city with a bicycle um, in the future uh, and do that safely and comfortably. So, um, and unless you are going to um, grow the ownership of bicycles, you know, in concert with this uh, as effectively, which you're probably just not going to, so I, I think there's going to be a, a need for a bike share system. Just you look at the distances, you have a hundred miles of trail, you're not going to be able to walk a hundred miles of trail, and you're going to be able to appropriate you know, bicycle really is that solution. So, again, just talking more about the city's experience with bicycle overall. Uh, we've got uh, 60 miles of, of bike trails that's uh, soft surface and paved. We've got uh, 25 miles of on-street bike routes, which are bike lanes, uh, bicycle uh, zero areas. Uh, we're investing over a million and a half dollars in capital improvement uh, funds annually into, into bike infrastructure. Uh, we've got a uh, fantastic bike education program in our public schools. Um, and we've got the most bicycle friendly businesses of any um, city in the state. And we uh, recently, this is kind of uh, a little bit premature, we're not supposed to officially announce, but I've been sharing with some people that uh, we did bump up our bicycle friendly community designation from bronze to silver. This year was a huge step. Uh, there are only really a handful of uh, cities in the southeast that that step up on, so we're really proud of that. And um, we look forward to announcing that uh, officially very soon. That's actually a really big deal. So. How do you get the gold? How many are gold? How do you get the gold level? What's the stuff like this? Okay. <laughs> how, how many cities in the U.S. are gold level? Uh, 24. 24 or 25. Um, and there's, I think there's 73 silver. So, um, and there have been over 1,200 cities that have applied for the program, and only about 350 of them have been designated overall. So there's not many cities you get designated at all, right. and only about 100 have been have made it past the Bronx. So when you're in the top, you know that's a very big crowd, really, um, when you get to that level. And, but we're we're already thinking about gold for 2020. I mean, it's a four-year designation. We're already thinking about it. That, aggressively pursue uh, gold designation as part of the plan. Now, are any of those 24 cities that currently are uh, you know, the same size, comparable, under 100,000 population, um, or they all met metro areas? So? Yeah, I think there are. They're just not. They're not in our part of the country. Uh, the nearest goal we've got now is, is off of Texas. Um, it's you know, significantly larger than we are, uh, but there are some uh, very small cities that are gold, like uh, Corvallis. Oregon, Bloomington, Oregon. Indiana. Yeah. Bloomington, Indiana. Eugene, Oregon, all those goals. Yeah, yeah. Have more than probably. College towns <laughs> definitely have um, a tendency to, to rank uh, more highly because they have a lot more of the kind of the rhythmic writers in the So we look to the college towns especially to model after. What kind of 
pushed us up silver? Was it just an increase in we, miles? Uh, yeah, our, our infrastructure did improve. Uh, we did some policy changes like our um, bicycle friendly um, ordinances that we that we were able to pass that uh, gave more effective uh, right to keep roads cyclists. That was something that, that they looked at. Um, uh, the education, public schools, that was huge. There was just a lot of, a lot of programming things. There's, there's actually five E's that they grade communities on. What tell them the five E's are? I can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I'll tell you how many people are here. Yeah, so engineering uh, is the most obvious uh, and first one that you look at. So that's your, you know, your infrastructure, uh, education, and so that can include uh, education programs for drivers and for cyclists, uh, for pedestrians, you know, just generally. Um, that's what I think. Uh, encouragement. Which is going to be like your bike month, your bike to work day, this kind of or uh, yeah, just trying to, to uh, encourage a culture uh, around riding and uh, into that enforcement. So that was like the, the ordinance and those kind of things. That's four. Education enforcement, grateful. Evaluation and planning. So mm -hmm. we, pass, we passed a um, uh, or adopted a new um, bike and pedestrian plan, our active transportation plan that uh, we adopted. Last, uh, last spring. Yeah, last spring, and and that was something that I was involved with as well, or the Superintendent really Department was involved with as well. So we really improved across all, uh, you know, the whole the whole game. Uh, and we're beginning to see really, and when you talk about sustainability, when you talk about environmentalism or whatever you want to talk about, you know, it's great that people aren't riding bikes, but where you really get the most. Benefit is when you're replacing car trips with, with bicycles. You know, it's, it's great to see huge <coughs> numbers of people turn out for, for a you know a social ride or a recreational ride. But uh, it's really um, where you start getting the best impact is with uh, are some great um, you know making great strides in that area. Um, this is just a you know very basic little Excel chart that they alpha the census data, but you can see trends in bicycle commuting, and 1.2% and might not sound like a lot. But it is it's huge. Uh, the national average is uh, less than half of one percent, and so we're well ahead of that. And for um, a place in um, you know, our part of the country to have um, that kind of vote share is significant. And uh, we're hoping to get to two and a half percent by 2020. Um, and I think I'm not a statistician. I don't know how to project that exactly, but I think we're on track. I think we're we're, we're going towards two and a half percent. Are, are any of the other cities on the big trail? Are any of the other supplies of this? So, the, uh, yeah, the, the Bicycle Friendly Community mm -hmm. Program. Yeah. Bentonville is Bronx. Oh, okay. And uh, Rogers recently applied uh, for uh, the program. They, they, it's an honorable mention uh, at the same time that we just applied. And uh, the region, Benton and Washington County, uh, regional planning did an application for the region, and uh, we were designated bronze in that category as a region wow. because of all the all the, uh, the work the regional planning has done to develop a uh, countywide uh, map for uh, planned trails and that kind of thing, and all the um, basically really just what all the that the foundation has done to promote biking across this whole north of Arkansas. So we've been, been recognized, but um, yeah, in different so regional or how many regional? There are a few like um, it's kind of a it's kind of a strange thing um, within the program where they they'll look at a place like I think Reno Sparks is one uh, region and it's it's kind of spread out but it's really one place um, and so North of Arkansas is kind of getting to that point and so I think they look at things that can be done at a little bit bigger level. They also just you know, state. <laughs> States and uh, they also do business with universities. Uh, University of Arkansas applied. They also just do an honorable mention uh, with a in Jonesboro, our Arkansas State got bronze. They, they did it big. So they didn't beat up on my little brother over in uh, Arkansas State. So. <laughs> Not we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's um, one more way to kind of hold their feet uh, to the fire. Just to Demonstrate that uh, that other places are are able to do. Uh, <laughs> question on the loaner bikes. Um, 
like ones you see now that are out in big cities and stuff, are they all single speeds or do they have? Typically they're three speeds. Uh, the ones I've written involving uh, kind of fire areas uh, and they've been three speeds, but uh, pretty much all the bike share companies offer uh, a seven or an eight speed model or something, something that has more gears, which we would need for sure. And e bikes are also becoming more commonplace in uh, bike share. And they recharge when you park them or something? Yeah, they can recharge. Um, I don't know if now is a good time, but I've got more questions about the bike and loaner bike program. Can I ask now or should I wait till the end or where are you at? Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't mean to do Fine, we'll wait till the end. Okay, okay. okay. Yeah, 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 more yeah, in yeah, more in depth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's just some data I was going to share with you all too. Um, farmer's market last year I did a, just kind of an informal survey of uh, 66 people just random posted at the uh, farmer's market to ask them some basic questions about their understanding and their perception of uh, bike share and got some encouraging results. How, how scientific this was, uh, I, I can't really say, but 74% um, uh, of uh, people surveyed either knew what, what bike share was or were familiar with it uh, pretty well. 24% um, had ridden a bike share in another city, which I thought was really a surprise uh, by that. Uh, these are, of course, these are people that are walking up to the May as bike month pen, so they might be a little bit more uh, apt to have ridden, have ridden a bike share. But uh, I like that only 12% said that they wouldn't use it. And it wasn't that they didn't support it, it just meant that they didn't feel like they would, they would necessarily use it because they already own the bike or you know, whatever. Uh, and then the, uh, the price is about you know, $25 to $80 is the most common, uh, commonly selected price range for remaining in membership, which is on par with a lot of the places across the country. Um, this has been um, kind of put out there uh, as far as something that we Pursuing the mayor mentioned this in his annual state of the city address, and it is something that is on the radar uh, nationally. It's been picked up uh, that, that we are in a kind of a uh, exploratory mode. This is a map that is uh, published on a, it's a Google uh, Wiki kind of map, and it's a map of all the bike share systems in the world. But this is just zoomed in on the U.S. If so you kind of get a sense of where they're country, um, you know, you've got uh, the kind of clusters in Colorado and in California and like, you know, on the coast, things like that. Um, you'll have a lot of bike share in, uh, we would certainly be the first in Arkansas and, uh, you know, our country. But we do have that little question mark on there, which means that um, whoever monitors this knows that we're thinking about it. I, I'm not sure how they, they haven't contacted me, but they know they have really into it. Yes, <laughs> Big Brother is watching us, and I know we're. So, um, but uh, yeah, to your question earlier about smaller cities, um, more comparable cities, maybe being uh, designated a highly uh, bike friendly. You don't have to be big to be bike friendly. You don't certainly don't have to be big to have a bike share system. Uh, so these are some kind of small and mid-sized cities that do have successful bike share systems. Um, I wanted to highlight Fargo, uh, which recently went online, and uh, they have. Uh, population of 105,000 um, and 14,500 students. So it's a little bit different, to, you know, student to population ratio to pay a bill, but they have um, a system that works both on and off campus, which I thought was uh, nice. And then the, the size of their system is something that's comparable to what we're looking at doing with 100 bikes running on the station just go off campus so on town, so something like that. So there's uh, certainly precedent for college towns to have Some bike share systems are only on campus, are all basically just for students. Um, and the example I wanted to highlight that recently went online uh, in Auburn, which is for Eagle, for Eagle Bike Share. And it's operated by a company called Gotcha Bike. Uh, this was their original, or their, their first launch uh, into the bike share industry. They normally provide uh, transportation on campus, but it's not bike share. It's more like a, a shuttle service, um, and they uh, incorporate a lot of advertising dollars into the shuttle service so that it doesn't cost a lot for the customer to uh, the university. And this was, was funded solely by the university and it's uh, made to, to be completely uh, an Auburn bike. It's an Auburn system, uh, it's operated by them. Uh, we're not operating, but the Gotcha Bike provides all of the operational service. Essentially they contract that out with all of the bike shop. And so it's turnkey, you really don't have to 
functions it, uh, that's all taken out uh, of their hands. And it's a very affordable option. So the uh, model that we're really interested in uh, and looking, in, looking at and learning more about. Uh, kind of want to monitor how the Auburn system works out in the longer term. They had a big kickoff, uh, but For ninety thousand dollars a year, it seems like a lot for ongoing cost for that many bikes. Is that just, I mean, maintenance and everything else? And yeah, that it's a leasing model, so you um, that that pays for uh, all your operational um, maintenance and the rebalancing of the bikes. So if there are uh, more bikes than you want in one location, they can shuffle them over to another spot. And it doesn't it, it doesn't take into account any of the user fees. So uh, depending on how you structure your user fees, that, uh, as those membership dollars come in and as the rental uh, overages fees come in, you can offset some of that as well. But uh, like I said, that's a very, uh, very relatively affordable contract. Uh, this is there's no capital outlay that Auburn had in this project. They don't own the bikes. They're, they're leasing the bikes, so they're you know, amortizing. Gotcha is amortizing out the cost of the bikes in that ninety thousand dollars. Per year, part of the operations and maintenance. I think pretty standard, like industry standard, would be like, like I know Zaxter is another uh, bike share company. They replace, they totally replace the bikes every two years. So you're never going to be out of ten old old bikes. And the the cost membership twenty five fifty whatever it happens to be. I mean, you can ride one once a month, or you can ride one every single day to class or right. whatever. Yeah, it's it's kind of the buffet pricing. Uh, but if you uh, basically you said that was the first 30 minutes is pretty common, uh, up to an hour, sometimes longer, uh, is free. But if you uh, check the bike out and you have it uh, beyond that point, then you start paying an okay. hourly fee. Okay. And then you can structure it any way you like, but that's, that's pretty standard because you want the bike to be turned back in and made available to yeah. others. Okay. A bike share, not a bike. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you want, to, you want to have them constantly turning over. Okay. That's the idea. Do any of them make available utilization data? Like out of their 75 bikes at any given time, what's usually available, what's usually in use? Yeah, um, that's a good question. And that kind of data is is available to the, um, to the customer. And when we go and ask for um, proposals, that would be something that we would look at. They, they try to spin the numbers kind of different ways. They say, like, well, we'll, 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 we'll do a station-based model. Uh, you get more rides per bike. And my thought is, well, I want rides per dollar. And so I want the most rides I can get per dollar that we have to spend. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that's so that um, in the smart bike technology, like if you look on the back of that bike over the uh, county cargo area, that's a GPS unit. It's a battery powered, and it's uh, it's also an interface to the bike. But it allows you to track the movement, and so you can see how far people are riding, how fast they're riding, where they're going. So you get a tremendous amount of data back uh, as the the manager of the smart bike technology, way more than just just knowing when people check the bike. So they check the bike out at this location, they check it back in at another location. You get group reporting, and so later just you don't know what they did in between there. Uh, exactly, you have a pretty good idea, but this, you get way more data and stuff. Um, and then just with the locations, um, you know, stations is kind of a, maybe a, a fitting word. Uh, some of the smart bike technology uh, companies are called hubs. So it's not really a docking station, but it is a, a designated point with a sign that says, um, you know, whatever it is, Fayetteville bike share here, and it's a preferred location. So you incentivize people to return them at the hub, so anyway, that's another story. But basically, you want you want those hubs or those stations to be where people work and where they live. So you want them to be at pertinent destinations. And so we're looking at a way to do that. Um, we have, you know, our GIS department is excellent at the city, and we, have, <coughs> we know where the densest areas are in town and how they transact with our bike network. There's your, there's your Razorback Greenway right there, this purple line, and the darker colors are. Areas of higher density, correct? Right. Um, so you can see how population dots are areas of high employment. 
you got Western Regional Medical Center, you've got some neighborhoods here, you've got a lot of multifamily college student housing in this area between um, Leverett and Carlin Avenue and you've got the University of Arkansas and downtown, but all that really lines up and connects, it's connected well already by the Razorback Regional Greenway. It's kind of set up really well to bike share and serve where folks live and where folks, where a lot of folks live and where a lot of folks park. And then uh, we're talking about tourist destinations as well. I know there's uh, commute trips uh, are something that we really like to, to focus on, but there's also a lot of other trips people make uh, in town, whether they're visiting or they're local. If you want to go out, I mean, uh, you know, all these locations that are served by the trail or by infrastructure, uh, and there are a lot of places that people want to get to uh, for leisure, as well as for uh, trips. When we're looking at the funding, uh, the most important thing that I like to emphasize is that the funding for just about every successful bike share system <coughs> is the mix. It's a mix of sponsorships, uh, user fees, and uh, public funds or grant money. And this is this is a uh, pie chart that I have put out there as a hypothetical model uh, based on some of the numbers that have been introduced when we've been talking to um, the city, university, and some of the numbers that have been put out as far as uh, the operational budget model, uh, round numbers. And so, you know, the slice of the pie that is user fees is relatively small. Um, the public funding is, is certainly a lot larger, but you're hoping, uh, the hope is that sponsorships really take on, um, you know, the majority or, you know, the, the biggest part of this. And uh, when we're talking about sponsors, we're talking about, you know, large, large local sponsors, which the various have, uh, we're fortunate mm -hmm. to have a uh, long foundation in the area with a lot of Walmart vendors, we have university, uh, large employers uh, that are interested in this market. So like in New York City, you see Citibank on all the bikes, and then London, you see Barclays, so they're the sponsor that's helped kick it off, but then uh -huh. you still got other funding. Uh, well, like they yeah. wouldn't be the ones running it necessarily, would they? <laughs> Uh, correct. Yeah. So, so the, sp the sponsors, um, who, like when you talk about City Bike or one of those big, um, you know, big bike share systems, in larger cities, those are pretty unique, and that wouldn't be something that would most likely happen here. Um, the type of sponsorships that uh, you get in smaller markets are, um, you know, you might sponsor five bikes, um, and you've got advertising space on the wheel well, the basket, and on the bike itself, perhaps, or you might sponsor a station, uh, something like that. Uh, a major title, like, title sponsor that underwrites the whole thing. Uh, that, that's pretty unusual. The city, the city system in uh, Chicago is, is very unique in that respect. And like when they do that, they're not running the program though, right? <coughs> no. I, I think that the New York uh, seems probably that uh, was run by the New York Department of Transportation. And I wasn't sure. I think, um, you know, you see their branding all over, but I didn't know mm -hmm. they were actually running it or not. Yeah. It's so, New, New York Metro, does it? And speak to Kansas, their system is run by their, uh, yes. their, uh, uh, their transit agency. The transit agency, yeah, that's the, muni, the municipal transit agency. And that's that's a model that I, I think makes the most sense, frankly, uh, because if you want to, what is this? You know, I think it's an extension of our transportation system. And so if you have a transit agency, they seem like the most logical choice to, to operate. If you have to have an operator, or you contract it out to a bike share professional management team that does finish it out of the business and, and can, can run it. And there's a very competitive bike share industry right now. Uh, I get uh, contacted quite often, followed up with quite often to see where we're at with this. And, and I can get people put out in the year or two that we ready to take proposals that uh, we get a lot of very competitive bids. Let's see now. The city is has one part of the organization here called. Is it parking and transit? Is it are those united? Yeah, we're the parking division. We don't have a transportation kind of department. I was just working on this idea. I'd like to hear a little feedback on it. Would it be sensible to reward someone for 
parking their car and getting on a bicycle? Like, could they get somehow a better deal on parking as long as they were biking? Like a park and ride. It'd be a, an idea there, a seminal idea. I think that with the bike share system, I envisioned a lot of people would use it that way. Um, like a park and ride. Like if you didn't want to pay for parking in downtown, let's say, and you wanted to park on the trail, you know, a couple miles away and, and ride a bike share bike in. I'm not sure how we might be able to incentivize it other than that you get free parking. But you don't have to pay for parking. Um, as, long as, you're, as long as you're on the clock for the bicycle, somehow you get a benefit for being on the clock in a parking space. Is that yeah, it might be that you're able to get access free parking at another location. Well, you wouldn't want to hold up the bike all day while you were at work, but maybe if there was a round trip clock that got credit for that. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess what I'm groping for is what are we trying to do by charging people to park? It's kind of the, the core idea I'm having is why are we doing that? And then what's the idea behind riding a bike from the point of view of the city? Well, I think, you know, we're trying, we're, our goal is to try and offer balance of transportation solutions and options. And, you know, some people may choose to take a bicycle and may not own or have access to a bicycle for that trip, and this is a transportation solution. Other people may not be interested in bicycling and want to drive downtown and park in a premium location. And for those people, we need to have the opportunity to park, so it's about providing um, different options for different types of users. But some parking is a means of money for the city, too. Yeah, land has value, and so. I mean, that's part of the city. My example is kind of interesting. I live about five blocks <coughs> from downtown. However, it's if you take topography into account, it's a nice bike ride one way, <laughs> but the other way is not so great. So, it'll get better. So then, <laughs> the erosion. <laughs> you know, I mean, the more you ride, the easier it'll get. That's why I drive my car, and then that's why I pay the city a dollar a day every day of the month to get a hang tag <coughs> so I can park and come and go. But you probably don't want to incentivize somebody to drive their car and leave it all day in a, a premium high traffic parking zone while is they're it, out on the bike because then they're taking up the is parking spot. Is it premium because it's a source of revenue? I would hope that that's more of a density judgment, but probably. Yeah. I think it's premium because it, people treat it as such. People want to park there. People want that parking spot in front of Thirsty's or whatever. A lot more than they want that parking spot over on a side street across there. That's why they want to take the extra time. They should plan for that. It's a premium spot. Premium real estate is the right thing. So, so let's say they've got a high density employer like uh, Washington Regional. Um, so, conceivably, you'd have a hub or something maybe there. Absolutely. Yeah. And then you could get right into work on a daily basis. I mean, is that one? way to use this and then they would park it there or is that not a appropriate use of the bike? Oh, yeah, that's that's great. I, I think that's, that would be a perfect use of that. And where you lived, where right, you right. would go to, um, if, if there was a station or a hub near enough to your, your house or someplace if you wanted to park and uh, park the bike in. Uh, and then you dock it and you walk in and somebody may use your bike during the day. Right. The idea would be that when you uh, a lot of these are smartphone oriented, so you have the app on your phone. You know when you're going to get off at five. You can check and see, make make sure there's a bike available, uh, and you can reserve a bike. Oh wow! So it's okay. like Red Box. <laughs> <laughs> you can say uh, you can click and reserve it. There may even be a, a, a minor fee to reserve it, or you're on the clock and starting at that point. Right. Um, but if somebody, if somebody were to walk up to the kiosk and say, and try to check it out, it could know this bike's reserved. And the ideal locations are those that don't necessarily just work for one type of use. Right. You explained right. I think Washington Regional uh, location works for what you explained. It also works for the employee who drove to work but wants to go take a bike ride on their lunch break. Right. 
um, if that apply can work, or for someone who wants to use the Washington Regional Park lot as a <coughs> parking ride, can right. drive to the trail and get on a bicycle and ride. So it has multiple different types right. of benefits. And that, those are the kinds of locations you want to think about when you're designing either stations or hub locations. I've, I've seen these elsewhere, but I've never used it, so I don't really know the details. So, like, let's say you wanted to hop on one during your lunch break and go to a restaurant, um, but you can't really leave the bike sitting outside the restaurant, right? I mean, you need to go to a hub and then walk to the restaurant, or with with a lot of these, with the GPS smart bikes, it will allow you to end your ride at any, any anywhere. I mean, you just you just walk the bike up to a, a standard bike rack or. I mean, does the bike have its own a lock that somebody else then can come along? Okay, I wasn't sure how that works. Yeah, it's like a uh, like a U-bolt lock that comes out of out of the back, and then you can lock it okay. to a, a bike rack or a. Um, okay. You need so you to. really did park in front of an annual restaurant uh -huh. or store or and, something like that. Uh, if you're and you can you can put you can, like I said you can figure the software the program where it has a lot. You can put a uh, a hold on that bike that you want to go in and make sure that it's available when you right. come back, or you may uh, not need it. You just make it available for another user. And use. Um, but there's usually uh, a fee. It's like, a, it's like an extra buck. If you if you end your ride off of the hub, then it's going to charge you a dollar. Then it's going to pay somebody else a dollar to take it back to the hub. So yeah. give them a free ride. You know, yeah. give them an incentive to free balance the bike yeah. for you. So you're not always having to drive around and, and pick up with the truck and, and shuffle them around as much. So there's uh, yeah, really like the smart bike technology. What if somebody decides to take it for a ride to Springdale Benton? <coughs> then, if you end your ride outside of like the geofence area, um, it's a significant slap on the wrist. Uh, your credit card. <laughs> I mean, you've got, yeah, you've got your credit card paid. You've got to have an app. Yeah. Uh, so they so got right up there. You've got to have a valid credit card on file. And um, I think that those, those fees are typically in the hundreds of dollars. Yeah, I would say like you buy a bike. You take it out. If you take it out and leave it you know, with somewhere. <laughs> but this, any, most of these types of systems are set up to where if there were a Fayetteville University-based system that launched and that system wanted to grow to include Springdale, Rogers, Bentonville. They could then, have affiliates. Yeah. Yeah. That could, yeah. that could yeah. 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 be incorporated. The Razorback Transit would be an affiliate network yeah. on there because mm -hmm. then you could always park it at a bus <laughs> depot and they've got bike racks and mm -hmm. you can shuttle back yeah, and forth. And the Razorback bus. Transit that would be the one that done their fair support. Yeah. Yeah. If you were savvy about this, you could get the bike, the ride it, put it in front of the bus, go further and get up and ride it somewhere else and then park it. I mean, I mean there's mm -hmm. many. All kinds of Yeah, there's all kinds of potential. Yeah. It's probably a little heavier than your standard bike, so get it up on that bus yeah. rack. But I guess it's a little more yeah. Yeah, that's conceivable. Yeah. And I think people, some people would do that. Uh, ideally, though, you know, you want to end your ride, get on the bus, and then there'd be another yeah. bike where you're going yeah. yeah. to go. You did need a bike at the end of trip. So really, it's, the it's trip. one way for you, to, you. You go from point A to point B, and then you do your thing, and then later you hop on another one to go back, or Ideally. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you said that um, small, like a small business could advertise on five bikes. Is that what you were saying as far as that goes? Yeah, on the on the bike itself, mm -hmm. there's usually there's advertising space on the, on the basket on the front. And there's usually a fender wheel well that has that kind of space. Uh, the bike itself uh, will have space on there. Uh, stations um, and some systems are sponsored and have uh, signage on those. With the model that we're going for, there probably won't be a whole lot of room for that in the beginning, and we're a little um, hesitant. Uh, we haven't really cleared that through the sign ordinance. We're not sure how that would play out, and so we're not really looking at advertising on the stations, but mainly it's on the bikes. Just on the bikes, but a small business that could advertise on all the bikes could take mm -hmm. right, they could one bike. Or one bike. Or, yeah. well, that's cool. I like that. And then also if tourists come to town, um, would they have a way is that a way is, will it be tourist friendly and for people yeah. who I mean, live this, in say We did another presentation to the advertising and promotion uh, folks and uh, they were really interested got these great trails. I mean, it's um, been so huge in these, and it's really one of our greatest assets locally. And uh, I talked to people like from 
Sales Market or wherever they say, mm -hmm. oh, I'm in from, I'm in from you know, wherever for graduation. And what, you know, what is, you know, what, what is there to do in the town? And you know, talk about our trails, but it's, it's not really experienced a lot of them on foot, you know, especially, um, you know, some folks aren't really in that kind of shape where they can do it with their current. Um, we have, yeah, a huge uh, potential. And one thing that was interesting is that uh, Peter, this is there when we were talking about Chicago, that they price, the price structure is really set up to favor locals. And uh, so when tourists come in, they get the one day pass or the two or three day pass. And uh, the tourists represent only one third of their user base, but they represent two thirds of the revenue. So, so yeah, so they get a very, uh, they basically subsidize the locals because it's just cheap. And if they come in and they're, you know, 10 bucks for a day, there's not a whole lot they're on vacation, but it's really nice to be able to offer that low uh, membership uh, price for the locals based on that. So, uh, yeah. So of course, the big emphasis on tourism. Okay. Yeah. Again, you want station locations that work for work, work trips, recreational trips, tourist trips, you know, all these. Mm -hmm. Think about football season. You could set up, you know, certain game day hubs yeah. from Bomb Stadium to Raceway Stadium. Yeah. 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 Make a killing. Yeah, they do temporary stations. Yeah. So uh, with this, with the smart bike, all you have to have is um, you just identify it on the software. You know, just draw a perimeter and say this is the hub, and then you put up some signage there, and then boom, you got a bike share sure. station. So the station-based model where you've got bulky overhead uh, tire, yeah, um, yeah, these big racks, you've got to uh, transport and pull down and put up, and you got to worry about solar power and all this stuff. You did have families too, as far as uh, you know, uh, family biking on the trails, mm -hmm. visiting in and stuff like that. That's yeah. really neat. The bikes are very usually very comfortable. They fit anywhere. They like to stay up anywhere between like five two and six two, pretty comfortably. Yeah. Um, they can just put a dust and step through frame. Close to you. You're not gonna. You're not gonna be flying around. I think we have some um, bike shops that rent bikes right now, don't we? Yes. Yeah, because I think I've heard people say they've come in and rented bikes mm -hmm. for the trail. And the, that. The, the city just started renting bikes at Lake Fayetteville or at uh, Lake Fayetteville as well. Uh -huh. so there are so there are some rental options, um, but this is uh, well, it's a lot different set of a different model right. of Yeah. That's the, the when you join, does that kind of cover insurance? Like if you have an accident or something? That's all. Uh, typically, that's all in the BYL helmets uh, on pretty much all of these systems. Um, that comes up a lot, and uh, in a perfect world, you know, you have a nice clean helmet for everybody, right? And they check them out, but that's just not that that problem hasn't really been solved very well. Um, I've seen the helmet vending machines and things like that, but people just don't people just don't want to do that. Um, so if you want a helmet, uh, great. And I think we could probably do a deal where if you show that you're a new bike share member, that um, we could direct people to the nearest bike shop to purchase a helmet that they, uh, you know, they feel that they want to be exploring. Might be able to offer a discount somehow, get the sponsors to help with that or something. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but that, that usually doesn't stop people from riding a bike, you know, on the trail, slow speed. If, if they know they're going to ride a bike and they know that they will not ride a bike without helmet, they'll bring it. Otherwise, having been hit by a truck, I'm a big fan of, of encouraging people to wear helmets. Yeah. Not um, encouraging them to ride without them. Yeah, and, yeah. Encouraging, yes. Mandating, no. Um, but yeah, it's a good thing. Bring your own. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, a few more. Is that, is that the end of it? Or is that that's the end. Okay. That's me. That's all uh, I had to talk about. But I'm happy to follow up with you guys uh, in the future if you have any questions about it. Or if you want to learn more, or if you want to uh, have me talk to any other groups for um, potential partners or sponsors or the organization that you think would be interested in what we're doing. Here, um, could be. We're looking at. <clears throat> we're looking
looking at the possibilities of some uh, uh, grant funding as well. Yeah. Uh, details to come. Yeah, but, uh, well, Texas is about to give away a lot of funding, so maybe we can take some of theirs. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you Ten think billion. this could be a reality? Um, anywhere from like six to 56 months. Uh, <laughs> um, I think once we get, we've, we've done, a, we've laid a lot of the groundwork, and I uh, said so just from talking to other uh, cities, it seems like one of those things that once you kind of hit a point of no return, and things start happening really fast. So yeah. I don't think that we've hit the point of no return yet. So if you got all the funding you projected, say by July 1st, what would be like, boom, starting up? If I called up, if I called up a bike share uh, provider and said, hey, I've got all the money we need, go, uh, they can have bikes on the ground typically within uh, four months. Okay. So what's that number you want to hit? I mean, I'd love to have $200,000 uh, annually to, 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 to run it. Um, I don't think we need quite that much, but that would be, you know, that would be fully funded, fully, you know, and, you know okay, we have some commitments for parts of that right. already. Got any? Yeah. We're looking at options. We've talked to Washington Regional. Uh, we're, we're having a very lengthy dialogue with uh, folks over at Razorback Transit at the University of Arkansas. Um, we're looking at a couple of grants um, that can help fund uh, part of that. I see that. I see uh, that's a five year, $1 million goal right there. Mm -hmm. That's a nice, two nice numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Is the interest uh, in from Razorback Transit? It can't be to relieve pressure that they're already feeling on their, on their buses because those guys are running pretty much empty. The so Razorback Trainer right now yeah. operates a um, small bike share program on campus called Razor Bikes, and they're yellow painted, black, black and yellow, black and yellow painted bicycles. Um, they're typically bikes that have been you know, left or by students, or somehow they've acquired them. These are not in any way standardized. Um, they, they attempt to repair them and then make them available through a uh, lock code to students. And they enroll in that program. The problem with our current program is that it doesn't have any revenue associated with it, so it doesn't have any user fees. Uh, it also doesn't have any accountability associated with it. So you can take a bike and go wherever and never bring it back if you don't want to. Um, so they're interested in getting out of that particular model that they're in right now and to one that uh, is a little bit more driving through and that has shown success in many other communities, particular communities that are similar size to us, and has accountability associated with it. So that's, uh, and they see bicycling as an extension of their transit system that they're already operating. Um, and so those are the reasons that they're interested in. Yeah, I don't think that they're looking to bike share to, as you said, relieve you know, pressure on overcrowding on the buses. It's also just to augment what they're doing and well, their overall mission for allow people yeah. to get to reach their destination. Sure. That last mile trip, because they can't go to bus, they don't have the resources to put bus stops appropriately, densely enough for all students to have you know 10 minute headways where you've got a bus coming every 10 minutes and you know you can do it. But if you get a bike uh, to get you from from the stop to a place a mile or two away, suddenly that makes transit a lot more accessible. I think that's the thing. It's not really a matter of handling the crowd, but just putting more people there, much like you were saying, if they're, they're underutilized to say, make transit more accessible by having this. Oh, and we've talked about this at Staff Senate up there, and one of their <laughs> issues with it too is uh, parking. Parking is always a problem on campus. So that's another. And you can park a lot of bikes. They are park. They are parking in transit. So, mm -hmm. yeah, they are absolutely interested from a parking. Really yeah. for their parking. Yeah, the Garland Garage and the Harmon Garage would be excellent spots for mm -hmm. alleviating some of that congestion. So, what about Ozark Transit? Would they have a? Would they be a potential stakeholder in something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they showed some interest in support. Oh, and by the way, I know where one of those yellow bikes is. <laughs> <laughs> it's the guy that always celebrates the Tour de France on uh, East Lafayette. And I put it out in front of his house. <laughs> oh. Every year. 
Probably. Missionary <laughs> Shaw. <laughs> After a couple of years, I probably owe three four hundred thousand dollars. Buy the whole thing. Does, uh, do, can, uh, can this program sustain itself if it wants to get going or not? Is it ever, it's, I mean, by... These, these systems these. will never be able to be fully funded with user fees alone. Well, but also advertising. But there, yes, you, I, I think there is a path uh, definitely for it to be sustainable without uh, public money, mm -hmm. without subsidies. Um, but, and through the sponsorships, I think that there are systems that, that are set that way. But there are some that exist. Yes. But just think about all all forms of transportation receives uh, some level of right. subsidization, typically through government funds. Your transit organizations I mean, are all, you know, uh, subsidized through federal, uh, state, local funding. Um, no, not. Even your, you know, driving your single-family automobile uh, on a roads are all you know, that transportation mode is also subsidized. Yep. So, wouldn't necessarily um, look down upon a system just because it can't pay its oh, own not way. Not at all, through, but through I just reason. wonder if it could be. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, through, through taxes, I mean, that would be wonderful, too, to get a portion of that and, and could also pull that out of money. Nice. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments, concerns? This, I think this is the most engaged group I've ever talked to. <laughs> questions from everybody. Yeah, everybody was uh, asking great questions. And, uh, yeah, I think it's a great program. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you at the schools also? Uh, I, the yeah, teachers? Sometimes I come down and um, I'll go with the outdoor education class. Uh, not down there nearly as, as much as I'd like. Uh, I also did a recently did a presentation to uh, Washington County JDC. Uh, we have a lot of programming for them and for the students. You know, just one, one quick other thing. I, I see a lot of bikers, bicycle riders have busy intersections, mm -hmm. how am I going to get across this thing? It seems to be it's an ongoing problem. Yeah, um, I think it's, um, it's tricky. It depends on the rider and their experience level and uh, what they're comfortable doing. Um, uh, there are some you know, best practices as far as how to navigate through intersection, any kind of intersection on a bicycle. Not everybody um, is aware of those best practices. But yeah, I see a lot of people just using the crosswalks and things like that too. So, yes, when we're talking about infrastructure, that's, that's a big, a big point of the system. It's uh, intersections. We just had a meeting today with the city engineer about, you know, how do we design these better to, to get cyclists to safely. So, yeah. something we're going to have. And walkers. I'll share something you guys might be interested in, but about at the very end. Was it kind of a setback in the uh, Archibald Hill? There was one proposal made by the city and didn't fly. Some traffic, oh, they set back? Some traffic stilling ideas and some pedestrian refuge concepts they were trying to sell. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Peter with the Naturalistic Landscape Ordinance? Yeah. So uh, at the last meeting, you all expressed some interest in learning a little bit more about the uh, city's Naturalistic Landscape Ordinance and finding out what uh, that ordinance is about, uh, how you can find more information on it, and uh, I want to bring you a little uh, report on what we saw of that. Share with you. I can't type and talk. A little at the same time. Um, it was 
very pleased to hear that y'all are interested in, in learning about this sort of and um, so we, what we did is we, um, we posted some information on it on the city's website, sustainability page right here in the naturalistic landscape ordinance. So this is an ordinance that was um, was passed in 2009 by city council. Essentially, it um, it was the result of some public interest in um, the ability to have naturalistic landscapes in the community, landscapes that featured native plants, pollinators, um, and supported. Um, habitat in our community. But prior to this ordinance passing, there wasn't a way for the city to recognize uh, yards that chose to, you know, not go with a standard turf grass, you know, more of a managed and maintained um, look. Uh, and so this this allowed uh, the ability for homeowners, property owners, uh, renters in the city to have um, yards that, that uh, featured some of these more native plants. And items such as that. So there is actually an application that is available online, and that application um, has a little introduction letter, and then it asks you to fill out a little bit of information about your property. Uh, very simple information, location. Uh, it asks for a maintenance plan. One of the things the city is, was wanting to prevent uh, as part of creating this ordinance was a, uh, a way for folks to just neglect no, their yard. No, no. Right. And I don't want to mow that are lazy and you don't want to let their yard do whatever it's gonna do. Um, and so there has to be an actual thought out, articulated plan. Um, and then a maintenance plan and then a little site plan drop what what this would look like and then a list of the vegetation um, that you would include. Invasive uh, species are not allowed as part of your naturalistic landscape for obvious reasons. And so it's, it's a pretty simple uh, program and process. You, you fill this out, you submit it through the Community Resources Division, um, which is two buildings down from here on the other side of the old Commerce Building. And uh, assuming you met all the protocols, include all the appropriate information, then you'll have yourself that approved. How many landscape. people have applied? So far, we've only have one. Uh, application thus far. 2009. 2009. Yes, so I think it's a good question that you all ask. Well, what about this naturalistic landscape ordinance? How many people have participated? What interest level has there been? How can we do a better job promoting it to the public and talking about it? Um, they applied and they were they successful in getting. Yes. I don't know what the property is. It's the one, but. Um, here's, here's part of the problem because with I redo my yard. I'm going to try to put in as many, and I do have some in, but not all. Mm -hmm. And where do we go to find? I mean, are there landscapers that just deal with that, or you know? And I'm somebody who probably should know that, but I don't. I don't know exactly. There are nurseries that that well, are educated that can tell you. Like Westwood, Westwood be one of them. Okay, so I can go to Westwood and just say I want all my plants to be natural, and yeah. I need somebody to help me. Landscape. They should okay. have See, someone. Any, any you know nurseries. I'm not promoting them, but any okay. other nurseries. Any right. nursery so here. Pardon me. Invasives. Some of them. I don't know specifically, but some of them still sell invasives because people want them. But it's right. they should be knowledgeable about Yeah, they should. Yeah. And I and I do find that sometimes when I ask, they don't know the difference. They right. don't really know. So we've got the lists and, and the, the list of what. Yeah, the, well, the invasive. Uh, oh, well, well, I know. Yeah, that part I know. I, I know the invasives kind of now. But I'm just saying as far as, um, I would tend to think if I don't know this or I'm uncomfortable with it, that people out in the community are too. So, you know, that's part of how, how do you get that information out so that people can know where to go or what kind of plants to get or things like that. I know on the farmer's market it's a great place to get information on that, but not everybody does that. So, Would the city, when someone applies, be able to have a list? of landscapers that you might know. Nice. Yeah, see, I think something like that would be really helpful to know that, um, you know, where you would go to find out that information. Because I know White River Nursery does, because that's where... Uh, right, White like, River... Are, they're they, very educated about. Yeah, they are. Uh, yeah, so that would be my your Yeah. 
I mean, Beaver Creek, uh, which is out past Eureka, they got all that jazz. But, but we're around here, so White River would be one. Yeah. yeah that would be mine. So it's the idea that people apply before they switch their yard over, or that they ideally, apply. yes, okay. um, they do. I guess if you already had it in place, <coughs> this is correct. It would be fine. <laughs> yeah, that's why I got to resubmit annually. Though, <laughs> right. Did, it, did they get a sign oh, or something for their yard, or? They don't actually as part of this program, but you can enroll in the uh, National Wildlife Federation yeah. Yeah. certified you wildlife habitat you know, program. Yeah, you can get wildlife for that. Now I do have that. Yeah. So. And essentially what this program does is it protects you, if, you know, if you're enrolled and go through the proper process, it protects you from um, the code compliance division, right, yeah. coming out and saying, you know, your yard is, your grass is taller than eight inches tall and you have a unsightly unsanitary condition in your yard and you have to blow it and you can say, no, this is actually an approved naturalistic landscape. Or they're going to know it's an approved naturalistic landscape. So what the Urban Forestry Award, or this is an urban, because I've seen a yard like that and they've got great plants in it. You know, they won an, uh, an Urban Forestry, I think it's called, award, and those are all. And there's a Sustainable Landscape Award? Is that yeah, where is that? What, is that part of the city? Is that part mm -hmm. of That's a program the Urban Forestry Advisory Board okay. maintains so and manages, and they've actually modified that program this year. Um, and it is uh, tailored more towards those that are growing food in their yards. Oh, and this one is food one. In in previous years, it has been <coughs> a naturalistic <coughs> type of landscape. Yeah, it's obviously next. I mean, you know, local plants and things like that. But um, I don't think they've ever been bombarded with applications. No, they've they've uh, you know typically gotten two, three, or four commercial and residential yeah, applications per year. Forestry also. Mm -hmm. Okay. See, and I think that's just a lack of education, too, as far yeah. as um, yes. um, I think, um, you know, when you say to a landscaper, make my yard look good, it would be better if you could say, or people would get more in the, you know, I don't want invasive species, I, you know, I want plants that are part of this region and so on. But there might be an opportunity there for to say that. Some, some landscape architect to hang a shingle and, yeah. you know, have that niche. I know we were in the... Home over the weekend for an event, and you know, in a convenience store, I picked up a little um, kind of like pre weekly, or you know, their version, kind of sort of. And um, uh, it had an article about the mayor's monarch challenge, Oklahoma mm -hmm. City mayor had signed, and so I you know, saw that and I grabbed it. I meant to bring it, and I didn't, but um, so their mayor signed up for the same program that mm -hmm. Mayor Jordan signed. And um, the article was written by a gal, and, and at the tagline said, you know, see her ad on the previous page. And sure enough, she's a landscape architect that specializes in, in uh, native <laughs> landscaping and stuff. Yeah. So she's got native prairie grasses and this and that. But, um, yeah, the article um, you know, talked about, you know, you can have a prairie on a porch. You know, it doesn't have to be all yard. You know, you can, you can do prairie grasses and, and milkweeds and this and that in a very small, you know, area. And that was kind of the pitch of the article and then promoting the wildlife or the uh, monarch challenge. Um, but yeah, you know, I think yeah, I think there's a, a niche there. There's some people that would love to have but we really don't involved. have that, do we? Not that I really know of. Oh yeah, but one landscaper getting that would be a smart idea. So here it is. We've got it on the website now. You guys are <laughs> The Environmental Action Committee, so get up there and start talking about this and uh, help us make folks aware of it. Where was it on the website? It is. It's on our sustainability page. I'm sure that you can probably also do a search yeah. for. And so they can't have any type of grass. I mean, I'm not talking native grass, I'm, I'm talking like that too. turf. <coughs> well, I guess this could be part of the yard, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't have to be, like, illegal yeah. to have a little turf. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You can you have, have a yeah. portion of your yard dedicated yeah. to the naturalist landscape. I don't see any reason why you Okay, could. that's good. See, that's good to know, too. That is very good. That's, I thought, if you got to wipe out your whole lawn, <laughs> <laughs> right. well, you know, I can't even begin to do that. Doug, tell me, that, you know, we went and saw at Crystal Bridges a couple weeks ago, you know, he made the pitch that, you know, you can still have 
you know, turf in the front for the kids to play in and, and in the back to throw the frisbee or whatever, you know, but then all the edges are all naturalized and trees and bushes and shrubs and some of that good stuff. So you can start someplace yeah, and yeah. just keep, right. keep growing. <coughs> Peter, do you know how long it might take to get approved once you do the application? I don't know the exact amount of time, but my impression is that it's not a lengthy review process. I would Does it go to? Just a couple of weeks. Sure. As a token plot. Yeah. Um, since you put it up on the website under the sustainability area, what about a link from the code compliance section? Since it would be, yes, it might be somebody that's yeah. looking at code compliance rules that would be interested in. I'll ask you to across that. Right about where you're talking about grass and weeds, eight inches or so. Can I kind of break off on the tangent? Because we might be in the right place for this. I went to Illinois River Watershed. They had their uh, low impact development green infrastructure workshop this morning. We were wondering about, and I think you got at least some of this, and that is like a clearinghouse for where you can find existing LID type projects. It, it seems like we've talked about that here before, like on maps, like three uh, lead projects. Is there on the city website somewhere we, do we ever get to that point where you can? We have art installations on the uh, city's uh, website, the map, map for art installations, I believe. Um, at least I know there is a draft of an art map that was put together that I shared with you all. And, and a con the concept was that we could think about okay. so I didn't know denoting if lead projects or LID projects. Because that was something we talked to brainstorm about this morning was, um, you know, it'd be neat if you say, hey, does anybody, has anybody done forest pavement yet? Or has anybody done, you know, the Green Group like the library? You know, it'd be cool to be able to find examples. I knew we'd kind of talked about that, and I didn't know if we ever got off center on it or not. I'm not sure if we've ever figured out how, you know, a good way to do it. But uh, anyway. So where did we leave off on that? Can we do that? Can we pick that back up and get that map rolling? We talked about that. It's been a while since we talked about that. It seems like we, we, we kind of, if I remember, we asked our, ourselves, each other, for input, and I think it kind of, just kind of yeah, slow down. Calling, we just never I don't really recall getting a lot of uh, feedback on the right. <laughs> LID side. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how to get it even started, like how to find what is out there. Um, somebody would have to champion it, I guess, and I'll do it. Talk to USGBC and find out what lead projects they've done. That'd be a start. Like a volunteer, um, but not all projects volunteer. Be <laughs> <necessarily> <laughs> but, but you know, there's certain several schools now that have done lead mm -hmm. projects, and the university I know. So maybe US CBC would be a good starting point. Okay. They might have a map, perhaps. Like, I don't know. That already be good. Um, yeah, I still think that would be something. I'm sure you can go to lead the US CBC website and find a list of projects in your community or by zip code. I don't know if there is a map that exists. Okay. Might be a start to this. Uh, We've got a good enough GIS system. It wouldn't be hard to put a layer on there as long as there was a good, well-maintained data source. Yeah. That's really the key. Finding them and then maintaining them. And Something for next month's agenda? Yeah. Can you send me what we sent in? I think I sent in some sites. Okay. Yeah. Can you yeah. just give me whatever you've got, and then I can... Well, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll, real quick, I'll try not to divert too bad, but the, the workshop this morning, it might be something we could make an agenda item next month. Um, so the Illinois River Watershed Partnership has EPA grant money um, through the <coughs> Arkansas Natural Heritage. Yeah. Anyway, they funnel it through Arkansas. Um, and um, so they've got a significant amount of money, and they can do five thousand dollar projects. Um, application process, of course, but the um, green infrastructure stuff, which is things we've talked about, you know, green roofs or green retaining walls or forest pavement or uh, bioswales and rain gardens, just all that kind of cool stuff. Um, uh, and right now, the grant funding is for 
government, uh, municipalities and counties and such, and churches and nonprofits. So it's not for private business at this point. But anyway, there's money out there. Um, we can talk more in depth. I can come more prepared. Um, or we have uh, Delia Hawk come and talk or take the door on that. Um, but uh, the, uh, I don't know, uh, they do these little workshops periodically, but it's a, a requirement to get a grant. You have to go to the workshop. And, um, but you know, the city would be eligible to apply for uh, parking areas or you know, any number of those. It has to be in the Illinois River watershed. Right, right. right. It's got to be on that side of the hill. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we looked at several of our city parking lots downtown area, but they're all on the White River. Okay. Yeah. Where's the dividing? It's, I don't know, across the hill. Um, like they, in this neck of the woods, it runs kind of right through Old Main Lawn. I know, like, I was working with McNair Middle School on the drinking water uh, fountain, the retrofit, and Beaver Water District was helping us. And, and during the course of it, we realized, you know, every, we all drink Beaver water, but they were not in the Beaver watershed, they were in the Illinois watershed. You know, block away. I think was the dividing line at McNair. You know, so McNair and Vandergrift for Illinois River. But um, yeah, so the, the line cuts it, a jagged line through, right through Fayetteville. And half of it drains one way, and half drains another. But anyway, that's out there. So there's a big part of Fayetteville that's Illinois River. You know. I have one. I have a question about the invasive species. Uh, Mr. Ford. Is it okay for builders? They cannot put a basket in. Is it just suggested they don't put invasive species in their landscaping, or they cannot do that now? They're not allowed to plant any of the 18 species that are on our list. On the list, okay. Uh, as part of any landscape plan that requires approval to the urban forest division, so that would typically be for. Uh, large scale development, any sort of multi family project, any sort of um, uh, commercial scale project would have a landscape plan a requirement as part of that project development. And those plans are not allowed to have invasive uh, species. But not a single house. A single house could still plan. Could still do that. My fine builders don't seem to know that when I mention it. To you. So I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong. The, the builder on a single family home could theoretically plan a ground. They're there. submitting plans through the city. It has to go through that approval. But not a single family. Not, not a single family. Not, you, right, right. But for like the, the major. Single family home is going to be exempt. Yeah. Yeah. So if, there's, if it's a single home, they're not going to. Right. There's well, nothing going to be flagged for them. So they're not going to. Yeah, they can plan what they want there. They can plan what they want. Yeah. So are you working on that? <laughs> Get out! <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, is there just no way to do that? Or, I mean, I think I told them that they yeah. couldn't do it, but I not that Well, you know, one thing that. But do you want to start working on that? <laughs> no. okay. Oh, well, I'm telling them. Well, they could, several builders what that. What they could do is, you know, they've still got to get a building permit. Maybe we could at least. Well, that's what I was wondering. Sure but, I mean, they act like that. What? What? Yeah, you know, you know, it wouldn't hurt to try to press that. Rackets pears, you can't plant those anymore? No, you can't. <laughs> I, I ran into others who, who think that it already applies to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So, okay. <laughs> it goes back to that education <laughs> thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. just, I would just want to see how wrong I was. No, just keep okay. going, Connie. I am. <laughs> I'm <Connie, laughs> <Connie, laughs> <Connie, laughs> If you want to work on that, you shop around the city council members to find somebody that will sponsor it, and I'll help you write the order. Uh, <laughs> is that what it is? Okay, so that is a possibility out there. Well, or, <laughs> 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 wasn't that your ordinance? You were the brainchild of the invasive species, weren't you? Uh, well, I mean, is well, your name on that? It was a that? project that, yes, I, okay. I led and worked on. Okay, um, I thought so, which is a wonderful project. Yeah. Uh, is there a, like this one is actually an old, old, uh, kind of dated brochure, but did we come up with mm -hmm. an actual brochure? Because yep. it wasn't, it didn't seem like it'd be that hard to hand that out to everybody who gets a belly permit. Sure. I mean, you know, I mean, 
They don't have to read it and follow it, but they might not. Read it. Your new brochure. There it is. There it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, um, that might be Your one way to get the word out. Because how many hundreds of building permits are here? We could at least get the word right. out. Right. And where do we get those? Because I do have a couple builders. I'd like to get that. Yeah. So, uh, it's either Bill Bailey's Building Permit Office, which is the office that we have here in Lincoln, or it's Bill Bailey's Design Office. You got one or two? Wouldn't it be great? <laughs> yeah, I think it's valid to hand those out to building, you know, to permits, so even homeowners. I mean, you know, building a garage or something. I mean, I don't see where that would be such a... Oh, bamboo. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. What else you got for us, Peter? Thank you, Steve. We got coming up. Hi, yes. Connie Chris. Mine and mine. Dun, dun, dun. Your position is uh, ending at the end of next month, June, <coughs> yep, June 30th. And so there is a vacancy on the really? Environmental Action Committee. I'm not re upping this time. Oh, you're not? I, I mean, well, I, I have struggled with that, but I, I have a house to build right now, and so it's a good time. I can re-up it another time. Yeah, I'm putting Well, I didn't know that Connie wasn't uh, refined, but uh, thank you very much You're for your many years of dedicated service. Maybe that's it. Hopefully we'll have you at least one more meeting in June. Oh, oh, yeah. There's always lovely seats you guys have. Yeah, you're always welcome to visit. <laughs> But in any case, I just want to make the group aware that there, uh, there is an open, there's an opening. There will be an opening available. Yeah. There is. And it's for your term. Is that the only, do we have any other open positions already or not? There's a, uh, you could go to the Marmalade Committee website on the city's uh, Sorry. web page and you can see that everybody's term length is, is listed on there. All the usual suspects, I'm trying to remember. But they're all, all that's not they're, here. Very, they're staggered. Rob's not here. Yeah. Rob, okay. yeah. I don't know what it was. Joshua. Yeah, Joshua. Her vacancy is I knew it was coming up. I wasn't sure when. So, but I knew it was <clears throat> so I thinking about it. And then I also wanted to make you all aware of the mobility plan that the city is, has undertaken. This is the city's master transportation plan. We did a series of workshops uh, two weeks ago. Dixon Street at the Fable Farmers Market, uh, several retailers around town at Walker Park, uh, trying to solicit input on parking and transportation solutions for the city. Um, and all that input that you can give in person is also available available to be given online. You can click right here to take the multimodal survey, which is very quick, taking less than five minutes survey, so I encourage you all to do that. And then um, this wiki map is really, really cool. Um, or any specific locations you have questions or issues that you want to point out, I'll let you click on it and share it with you guys because I think it's so cool. Um, but you can go to this map and um, you can add a little icon for the type of transportation solution that you think needs to be made in a particular location. So earlier I heard Richard Is talking there a about. Bike share icon on there? Uh, there's a bike uh, icon. There's not a bike share icon, but there's a bike icon. So Richard's location right here, he was talking about, somebody made the comment, bike ped crossing at South Street and Archibald. Archibald. Yeah. I don't see that happening. Um, our is current. So. But you can um, obviously make a comment in any of these six categories at any location. So like town. all the little crosswalk guys, those are probably people that commented that their intersections are Problem or yeah, let's see what it says right here. It says uh, there should be clearly marked crosswalk, crosswalk across this intersection so people can access the trail more easily. Uh, west, yeah, yep. down by the yeah. <clears throat> So this right next to that says people should exit the library and look left. You can do the survey and you can go through the map and provide all your input and really appreciate it if you all uh, can do that if you have time and 
share their Facebook. information. Yeah, friends and on Facebook. Yeah. Is, is this map a time limited thing? Will it be? It, it'll be up for about another month. Okay. Because it um, seems like it could be a great tool for just ongoing anything. Yeah. Yeah. Issue yeah. issue raising. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. The purposes of our plan. Yeah, we need to set a cutoff right. period and take all the input and put it in the yeah. cost yeah. and start coming up with. But now we've got a solution. <laughs> So I wanted to make you aware of that. And, uh, yeah, he let me know he was going to be here late, but I didn't hear about it. Then uh, in other news, uh, Garn asked for an update on the uh, recycling master plan. Um, didn't put any formal on here, but just want to kind of make you aware of where you things are at. So you're aware of the um, pilot projects that are happening as part of that. So there's a, a single stream, single family recycling pilot project that's happening in Southeast Fayetteville. That's a three month uh, pilot that started in January and their last collection day for that uh, pilot project will actually be this Thursday. So that pilot is about to end. Um, there's also a multifamily recycling, uh, multifamily single stream recycling pilot project that is taking place in two locations, the Clips 2 in Sterling Frisco, just up the street from here. Um, again, another three months of collection for those two locations. Uh, that is set to continue until June 25th, that pilot project. Uh, and then there's the commercial food waste composting pilot, and that project will, uh, that pilot is, is going to continue through June 6th. So it's set to uh, end here in just a couple of weeks. That, that composted material has to be finished composting by the beginning of August. Uh, so that's the reason for the cutoff on that particular project uh, in June 6th. So we're in the uh, process of compiling all the data, participation, tonnage, contamination, uh, recovery, um, efficiencies, and um, feeding that into a cost of service, a couple of different cost of service models for um, changes to the existing compost and recycling programs for the city. And those initial recommendations should be coming forward towards the end of the summer. Plan recommendations will look like. We'll plan on bringing those back to you all for discussion and input before they make their way to the full city council. So Kessler's full report will be after after all of that, so they can incorporate that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, maybe August or fall or. or it, I would envision, um, yeah, adoption, um, <coughs> beginning of implementation. But the draft, do you think, will be more that? Yes, I would imagine that sometime in the late summer. Okay. Are they filling the compost? Um, I don't know if they have finished product from the food waste pilot yet or not. I think that first batch from February is done. I don't know if it's fully yet, but it should be done by now. It, it should be close. close yeah. yeah. But yeah, it'll be available. Did you uh, get a chance to attend the, the private public meeting, I guess it was, mm -hmm. public forum, I don't know what you call it. The, the, uh, the flash presentation yeah. from Ripple Glass? Yeah. I did, yeah. Is there anything to report? Uh, it was actually a really interesting uh, presentation. So Ripple Glass is a, um, <clears throat> I didn't realize this, they're a, a spinoff of the Boulevard Brewing Company in Kansas City, and, and their mission was to really admirable um, organization their mission was to create a uh, glass recycling program for the greater Kansas City metropolitan area. Uh, 15 years ago, about 3% of glass in the Kansas City metro was getting recycled, and today upwards of 20 to 25% of glass in Kansas City metro is getting recycled, almost all of it through their program in Kansas City's pretty big metro area. So uh, really admirable. Um, they run a lot of uh, drop-offs, and um, then they also have some systems where they run uh, glass routes. Um, in the Kansas City metro area. Uh, then they're also collecting glass from a lot of communities as far away as Little Rock, um, since they're glass in Kansas City, and we obviously send all of our glass uh, to, to Ripple. I think it's either made into beer bottles or turned into Owens Corning uh, fiberglass. And they've had a, a variety of different experiences working with um, single strength programs in glass, some good, some bad. 
they shared some of that information. And um, overall, I thought it was a really interesting presentation and discussion. It's a bunch of work. They're black. Yeah, they're, they're um, very successful. So the, war, the worry with single stream is that you're going to have more broken bottles. And they were unambiguously uh, pro pulling the glass out of the single stream. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, or dual stream. stream. Yeah, they've yeah. Some, any, they've any system. They've negative experiences, I think, working with uh, single stream programs that were uh, that, that produced contaminated glass, and they really, they, they like, they need basically pure glass, so they like, uh, that's why they're big fans of glass drop-offs and separated glass collection. Uh, they like our glass because we're going to separate it and try to put there, so they're not shy about their sharing their experience, their previous experiences of working with single stream programs that didn't produce quality glass. And I, and I think if, uh, if single stream glass collection is in the future for Fayetteville, we're not interested in a, a program that produces low quality Glass. So we certainly heard them when they when they said that they are not interested in contaminated glass, and we're not interested in trying to give them contaminated glass. So. And there was some talk at that information session about having another one from with different industries uh, talking about their contamination issues too. There was, yeah. yeah. So I haven't heard if anything like that is is forthcoming, but we'd okay. certainly be interested in hearing how hearing if it's the same story from. Multiple right. Right. Yeah, well, if, uh, I'll try to keep my eye out on the free weekly and see if there are any other meetings like that coming up. If you guys hear that, I'd like to all share that and try to make the next one. What kind of contaminants were they speaking of? What was the nature of the contamination? I think the worst one they talked about was just wet paper sticking to everything and being hard to separate with the air blowers. I mean, for them, I think it's anything that's not glass. Mixing, mixing all the glass with other recyclables causes just the, the overall mixing of recyclables is contamination. Yeah. Oh, they prefer it if everyone, you know, rinsed everything and dried it out before you put it in your curbside <laughs> and everything. Well, can't be. Yeah. Most people just finish up the throw it in the bed and throw it outside. Why did they do that? Anybody have anything else? I guess we are adjourned. <laughs>